Welcome, my fellow followers of Adam, to this video that looks to put together all of the far-flung pieces of lore to paint a picture of what the state of the United States military was before the Great War, and, consequently, what happened to them in the wake of nuclear annihilation. This won't be an exhaustive look at every individual, story, or location that was affiliated with the military, but a high-level look that will use individual stories to help us understand where the lore is non-existent or vague. So, sit back while we unravel the story of the United States military. I want to start by examining the different branches of the military first. The US Army is the branch that we have the most lore about, and where we will start for this video. The pre-war US Army was engaged in many conflicts and operations throughout the world and within the United States. Just prior to the Great War, the United States was engaged in a massive war with China that saw army units engaged in fighting in multiple places. In January of 2077, the United States officially declared victory in Alaska after defeating Chinese forces and liberating Anchorage. However, it is highly likely that a strong military presence remained in Alaska up to the Great War. Although we don't have any confirmation of this, it is likely that the military dug in and fortified the newly liberated Anchorage and it is equally likely that there were still pockets of Chinese resistance and holdouts in Alaska. It would not be surprising that a campaign similar to the U.S. Aleutian Island campaign fought in World War II was underway, although, again, I must reiterate that this is just conjecture. At any rate, with the declaration of victory in January and the Great War happening only nine months later, it is very probable that a number of army personnel were still stationed in Alaska, so I am marking this region as an area with a high probability of having an army presence. It is also likely that there are defensive positions along the western portion of Alaska as well, although, again, this is just speculation. The bulk of fighting between the United States and China shifted to the Chinese mainland once the Chinese were pushed out of Alaska and China was on the defensive. We know that heavy fighting happened in Shanghai and that US forces penetrated at least as far as Nanjing, so we know for sure that American forces were in Shanghai and Nanjing and areas in between, with a likelihood of also being in other surrounding cities, and the army may have participated in this fighting alongside Marines, which lore has confirmed had units fighting in Nanjing and Shanghai. The U.S. was also mentioned to be fighting in Shantou, which is farther south than the operations taking place in and around Shanghai. This comes from a Boston Bugle article, where it seems to imply that Shantou was the farthest south American forces were in China by saying, quote, From Anchorage in frigid Alaska to Shantou on our enemy's doorstep, American troops have been embroiled in brutal battle. This would seem to imply that Anchorage and Shantou are the two outer boundaries of fighting, so in light of no other cities farther south than Shantou, it is likely that there was no fighting further south, so we can mark Shantou as definitely being an active front. We also don't know for sure which branches of the military were actively involved with the fighting in Shantou, and the army may have been involved. The only other portion of China that may have had American forces fighting in it is around the Gobi Desert area as part of the Gobi Campaign. The only mention in the entire series of this front is the Gobi Campaign Scout Rifle, and we are left with zero other information. In light of this, we don't know if this fighting was taking place in the Chinese portion of the Gobi Desert or the Mongolian portion. Furthermore, we know that China had expanded their borders, but we don't know to what extent, so it is possible that Mongolia was occupied by China, and therefore fighting could have taken place completely within the Mongolian portion of the Gobi Desert. In light of this, we can consider any area in and around the Gobi Desert as possibly having a US military presence, most likely consisting of airborne divisions, since the Gobi Desert area is so far inland. And I'm going to just inject a little bit of Rad King speculation here. Again, this is not at all confirmed or even hinted to by lore. We often just assume that the Gobi campaign was part of the wider war with China. Perhaps the Gobi campaign references a different engagement and not the current war with China. This could include some sort of US-backed insurgency where US troops or special forces were helping Mongolia or some other group within that region resist Chinese invasion or occupation. Again, that is complete speculation. We're just going to assume that this Gobi Desert campaign is part of the wider war with China. No other portion of China is mentioned as having American units, and I find it peculiar that other than Shanghai, key government or economic centers of China were not targeted by the US, including Hong Kong, Guangzhou, or of course, Beijing. 
It is difficult to ascertain what the overall objective of U.S. forces were by invading Shantou and fighting in the Mongolian or Inner Mongolian regions. Taiwan's fate in the Fallout universe is unknown, but it would of course provide a great strategic advantage to portions of the mainland in terms of U.S. air support and resupply, so its exclusion is very noticeable. The only other fighting confirmed overseas is in the Philippines, where fighting between the army and communist forces was occurring on Mamba Jiao. But no other part of the Philippines are mentioned, so it is impossible to know if Mamba Jiao is a foothold in a campaign to retake all of the Philippines, if it is the current front with the American forces occupying the south, or perhaps even the Americans occupying the north and cutting off the southern forces from support and supplies. A final scenario that is also possible is that the fighting on Mamba Jiao is some sort of isolated communist insurgency, or even perhaps the last of a mop-up campaign that successfully defeated the bulk of communist forces in the Philippines. At any rate, we know for sure that fighting is happening specifically here in the Philippines. That may involve the army, but most likely is mostly or entirely composed of marine fighting units. I would be remiss to only cover the distant battlefronts since the army occupied the US's northern and southern neighbor, Canada and Mexico. The Alaskan oil pipeline was guarded by the army against potential attacks from foreign enemies, but also the more likely scenario of Canadian saboteurs. The army was key in annexing Canada in 2072, defeating any defense efforts and suppressing civilian resistance in brutal fashion. Quelling internal resistance continued from the date of annexation until the Great War. It is extremely likely that the army had a presence in all major cities and economic centers, as the U.S. extracted as much as possible from Canada to meet the U.S.'s economic needs, and later to fuel the war with China. Mexico was invaded by U.S. forces at some point before the Great War, but only the Fallout Bible gives any details as to the events. Supposedly taking place sometime after 2051, after several years of economic destabilization by the U.S., the United States invaded under the pretext of self-defense, citing violence and pollution that was apparently spilling over the border. It is reasonable to assume that the U.S. stationed army units in major cities and economic zones, although we have no in-game confirmation. That brings us to the last known area the U.S. Army was active in prior to the Great War, the United States itself. The Army was active in defending areas from rioters and suppressing protests. One example was a food bank in Roxbury, Massachusetts, where a riot took place due to food shortages. The riot ended with army personnel who were tasked with the defense of the food bank killing four civilians and injuring eight more. And this is just one of many unspecified riots that took place across the nation. The army played key roles in enforcing martial law, as is evidenced by Mr. Gutsy's, that can be found roaming the wastes still attempting to enforce curfews. In addition to these activities, army personnel and military police were in charge of detention facilities across the United States, like the Turtle Dove Detention Camp in Maryland that detained people of Chinese descent, as well as known or suspected Chinese collaborators. The army was funding and pushing for the completion of the Liberty Prime Project, which was originally intended to aid U.S. forces in pushing Chinese forces out of Alaska. Even with the pre-war tech giants of Robco and General Atomics, Liberty Prime would never see combat due to a power supply issue that was never solved before the Great War entombed a partially functional Liberty Prime below the Pentagon. Another Army project involved the U.S. Army Robotics Division and General Atomics, where research was done to produce the now infamous RoboBrain robots. This research and development operation involved using prisoners and Army deserters as experiments wherein their brains were removed and programmed to operate RoboBrain robots, as well as other robotic creations. While RoboBrains never achieved full production status due to issues with the technology and unreliability of the brains, many were used on a provisional basis in places like the Sierra Army Depot, Mariposa Military Base, and West Tech Research Facilities. The close association with vault Tech also meant they procured many robots themselves. In 2076, the Army struck a deal with Nuka-Cola to initiate Project Cobalt, which was a project to research new chemical compounds that would have military application. Signing over some of the top Nuka-Cola scientists, they created something codenamed Quantum that was based on a radioactive isotope of strontium. This substance would amplify the energy output of conventional weapons, as well as derive energy from ballistic and energy rounds impacting a surface, which was a perfect application for armor. A few prototypes were constructed, including an X-01 suit of power armor and some mini-nukes. However, the Great War stopped the project in its tracks before mass production could begin. 
A team of Army personnel were in charge of guarding gold being transferred from Fort Knox to Vault 79 in Appalachia, where it was meant to be safe enough to survive a nuclear exchange and ensure the U.S.'s ability to re-establish itself. There are several Army organizations whose exploits are worth mentioning as well. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers were key in the development of the T-51 Power Armor that helped accelerate China's defeat in Alaska and gave U.S. forces an advantage in the Chinese mainland. The U.S. Army Reserve was called upon to assist with disturbances and civil unrest in the United States, like defending the Boston Police Rationing Site. A Ranger Group was engaged in war game exercises in Appalachia in the days before the apocalypse. Lastly, the Army Intelligence Corps were assigned nuclear launch codes in the days prior to the Great War. The last main point here, but certainly not the least, an Army security team was transferred to the Mariposa Military Base, where all FEV research was transferred to on January 7, 2077. The FEV research was in advanced stages where experimentation was being done on human subjects. After months of securing the base, the nature of the FEV experiments started to become apparent to the security team, and upon discovering these experiments were being conducted on military prisoners, the soldiers demanded something be done. Two days after this, on October 12, 2077, Captain Roger Maxson stepped forward to save a scientist from being killed, but organized interrogations of the scientists and base personnel. Such were the state of things on October 23rd, 2077, when the Great War kicked off, and any self-respecting Fallout fan should know who this group would go on to be. The United States Navy is the next most talked about branch of the military in the Fallout series. They were involved with coastal patrols and defense around the U.S. mainland, and even though it is not explicitly stated, the Navy was certainly engaged in fighting, support, and defense wherever combat occurred, meaning around Alaska, off the shores of China, and in the Philippines. All of these locations definitely had some sort of Navy presence. We do know that Navy ships were outfitted with nuclear torpedoes as a friendly fire incident that occurred during the Anchorage campaign resulted in the sinking of the USS Eben Atoll where all hands were lost, making it one of the worst US naval disasters since World War II. We know of the Mount Desert Island Naval Facility in pre-war Bar Harbor, Massachusetts that served as a dry dock housing the USS Democracy, which was a United States ballistic or cruise missile submarine. While it was being repaired, the captain deduced that they were being deployed to the South China Sea in preparation or anticipation of a nuclear exchange, where they would be required to fire the nuclear-laden payloads into China. Arnold could not abide this and sabotaged the nuclear reactor of the submarine, which flooded the facility with radiation, and he made off with the nuclear launch key. Things did not end well for him, as he was threatened with a good time by being court-martialed, and he ended up being tortured by his mistress, who was extorting him for information relating to the nuclear launch key. The two of them died as Arnold shot his mistress and later succumbed to injuries he received from her. That is the state of the facility by the time the bombs fell. From this, we can assume that a number of submarines with nuclear armaments were off the coast of China, with the South China Sea being mentioned specifically. Off the coast of Maryland is a small Chinese submarine that became non-functional and lost while engaged in patrol and reconnaissance duties. The US Navy became aware of the submarine and was in the process of trying to recover it in order to access any useful data when the Great War stopped those plans dead in their tracks. The Navy's role in combat, defense, patrol, and resupply seems standard and to be expected, but the Navy was also funding a good deal of research prior to the Great War. In Maryland, there was a naval recruitment center that doubled as a location from which the Defense Intelligence Agency's Lieutenant Crumfoltz operated, looking for suspicious individuals that were also actively monitoring Dr. Jiang, who was a Chinese agent posing as a defector. Crumfoltz was able to uncover Dr. Jiang's ties to a Chinese agent named Wan Yang, who was involved with sabotage at a Niagara Falls facility. Due to this, Wan Yang was detained by U.S. agents and imprisoned at the Turtle Dove Detention Camp. Located in West Virginia is the Sugar Grove Naval Radio Station, which was built to gather many kinds of intelligence with a special emphasis on three distinct operations. One was monitoring the miners of Appalachia as they sought to fight the automation that was replacing their jobs and unionize. They were also involved with investigating financial activity that could possibly lead back to China and uncover covert Chinese operations. And lastly, they were to monitor and provide reports regarding the secessionists that formed the Free States in September 2077. 
The vigilant look for Chinese influence almost led to uncovering the Mama Dolce's food processing plant in Morgantown as a Chinese operation in September of 2077. But apparently this never became a high priority as the Chinese operations in West Virginia remained undiscovered prior to the Great War. These efforts led to the abduction of Edgar Orson, who was a union activist, and his subsequent murder, with his children being put up for adoption afterwards. So, these guys were serious, and this was not the last time those involved with unionization efforts would mysteriously disappear. A few research initiatives were also undertaken by the Sugar Grove Station, including the Somnus Initiative that was of particular interest due to the potential benefits it would afford the government in undercutting subversive movements and unions. Civilians were abducted and put through a programming regimen to turn them into sleeper agents that could be activated at will, experimenting with various demographics including children, adults, drug addicts, and the gainfully employed. With a few isolated successes, the project ultimately ended with unceremonious failure where they were unable to get reliable results. The facility was also working on Project Barrier that was an attempt to make an electromagnetic suppression field to dampen gamma radiation, effectively countering any potential radiation weapons. This was meant to defend a small area, but was abandoned when the energy to power the emitter required the equivalent of three industrial nuclear reactors to protect a 20 square foot area. The project was abandoned shortly afterwards due to this issue. The Locust project was an attempt to make self-directed vertibot swarms that could covertly access installations and hack mainframes, but was also discontinued when the smallest the vertibots could get was the size of a sedan, which defeated the covert purpose of the robots. The Spotlight project was built to scan buildings and installations with a neutrino pulse emitter that would create internal maps of the area of interest. When testing on a civilian building, it resulted in casualties that were blamed on a quote, sudden mass psychotic episode, and the project was cancelled. The Siphon project was meant to develop an automated data exfiltration holotape that could scan hostile networks, record, and compress the data. However, the $15 million holotapes were twice the annual budget of the entire analysis division, and the project was transferred somewhere else. Finally, the Pulsar project was an attempt to make EMP weapons to deploy in the battlefield, but required a tedious process of blasting robots with EMP waves, taking them apart to assess the damage, and then putting them back together. One of the research scientists automated the tedious process, which ended up being much quicker, and he decided to take a vacation when all of his time was freed up by this newly automated process. While he was gone, there was a runaway effect as the large amount of data generated started to consume all of the facility's data storage, and the amount of energy required to continue the process and store the data caused the facility to consume an inordinate amount of power, causing brownouts in areas around Sugar Grove. The scientist was reprimanded and the data was taken off-site where it could be combed through for useful information related to the project, where no substantial findings could be established before the bombs fell. The base also served as the facility where the Athena AI was housed, which monitored astronauts participating in the Deep Sleep Project, which aimed to evaluate methods of enabling a hibernation-type state for people undergoing space travel. Lastly, the Navy was involved with Nuka-Cola at the Kanawa Nuka-Cola plant in West Virginia, where they tested various chemical mixtures, although the kinds of things being tested and the point of the research was never revealed. While the Coast Guard operates independently from the Navy in peacetime, they fall under the command of the Navy during wartime, so I'm going to include the Coast Guard mention here. A Coast Guard office has information related to anti-smuggling efforts along the New England coast, where they had successfully intercepted some chem smuggling. This was no doubt being conducted along all portions of the U.S. coast prior to the Great War. Such was the state of the U.S. Navy in their combat and research endeavors prior to the Great War. Similar to the Navy, explicit references to the Air Force's role in the war efforts prior to the Great War are seldom. However, it can be assumed they were heavily involved in offensive, defensive, and support roles in all theaters of war and occupation in cases of Canada and Mexico. Just like in the real world, they were in charge of the Strategic Air Command, which was the U.S.'s plane-borne nuclear response. However, we do have some information relating to pre-war Air Force activities. Although there are no Air Force bases or facilities in the Commonwealth, historically the area was heavily utilized as a staging area, including, most notably, nuclear bombs. These bombs were stored in the Sentinel Site Prescott, where ballistic test launches were performed 23 times, as well as experiments focused on the most effective ways of combining nuclear payloads to the existing missile platforms. 
On the eve of the Great War, a test launch failed to register with the base's systems, and the locks and blast doors stayed activated, trapping the personnel. Any other time, the staff would have been extracted. However, the next day was the first and last day of the Great War, dooming them to die slowly in their military-grade tomb. Several bases are explicitly mentioned within the series, with one of the most notable being Nellis Air Force Base in Nevada. Known as the United States Air Force Warfare Center, it was a very active site, particularly for training where multiple virtual reality training pods were actively used. Due to the importance of the site, it took several direct and indirect nuclear detonations at the time of the Great War. Adams Air Force Base was several miles south of the White House, and an active Air Force site equipped with a large mobile satellite or space shuttle launch platform, although it is not clear if such launches actually occurred at this base. Not far from Boston was Satellite Station Olivia, which was an intelligence space that received a high volume of signal intercept traffic, which required a dedicated on-site staff to interpret for useful information. In the days before the Great War, it was in the process of getting upgraded equipment and solving a cockroach problem in the basement. We have mention of three bases in Alaska, not far from Anchorage, that include the Chugak Overlook Station, Elemendorf Base, and the Fire Island Station, although we don't have any other specific information. The Marines are mentioned explicitly several times in Fallout lore. Their active areas of combat are mentioned in an issue of Future Weapons Today that features a story about a Marine sniper engaged in combat in Nanjing. The combat armor of R.B. Vickers, which is found in Honest Hearts, mentions fighting in Shanghai and Nanjing, and he was a confirmed member of the Marine Corps. Given the Marines' specialty of seaborne invasions, particularly during World War II in the Pacific Theater, it is highly likely that the Marines spearheaded the invasion of Shanghai and subsequent push further into the mainland. Although it is not stated explicitly, it is likely that the Marines were directly involved with the invasion of Shantou and engaged in fighting in the Philippines. However, this is based on historical precedent and Fallout lore is not specific in regards to what branches of the military were involved in these two specific engagements. Also, there is no direct reference to the Marine Corps fighting in Alaska, but it is highly likely that they were involved in the fighting there as well. The Marines were likely also used in controlling and occupying Canada and Mexico before the Great War, although there is no official confirmation. There are, however, many confirmed instances of Marines stateside engaged in a number of activities in defense of installations and in crushing civilian unrest. Through the use of the United States Marine Corps contractors, people of Chinese descent were transported to various detainment sites like the Turtle Dove Detention Center and the PA-32 site under Executive Order 99066, which gave sweeping powers to surveil and detain persons of interest and Chinese descended people. The Marines were engaged with Army Rangers in Appalachian War Games just before the Great War, and were also primarily in charge of defending the Sugar Grove Naval Site and the Mount Desert Island Naval Facility, which housed the aforementioned submarine, the USS Democracy. The Marines also developed their own heavy armor that, while not powered or mechanized, was second only to power armor in effectiveness, although it is not clear how widespread the use of this armor was before Bomb Day. The last branch of the military mentioned in this video is the National Guard, which has several mentions throughout the series. While it is likely units within the Guard were deployed to active fronts, Fallout lore only specifically states the Guard's activities within the continental United States. It should not be a surprise at this point that the Guards were used to confront civilian unrest within the states. A very infamous example is the National Guard's attempt to break the strike at the WV-06 Poseidon Energy Plant in West Virginia confronting striking workers with tanks, APCs, and hallucinogen riot control gas. The plan was to use the gas to make the strikers turn on each other and start a riot, which would be used as justification for cracking down harder on the whole movement. The gas ended up affecting strikers and guardsmen alike, resulting in widespread violence and many deaths. Members that comprised the National Catastrophe Relief Auxiliary were called into active deployment throughout Washington, D.C. on classified information that indicated a high probability of a large-scale catastrophe on October 22, 2077. This was very prescient as bombs fell the very next day, while many of these units were deployed in and around Washington, D.C. Nate, the male protagonist of Fallout 4, is a confirmed member of the 2nd Battalion of the 108th Infantry Regiment, which is in the New York National Guard, and was able to use his status to take shelter in Vault 111. That is the extent of Fallout's pre-war history regarding all branches of the military. 
although there are some references that do not fit within any single branch and have to be mentioned to get the full picture of the state of the US military before the Great War. At some point before the Great War, fighting between American forces and an unknown foe took place on the moon. The only mention of this is in the Museum of Freedom, which mentions fighting taking place in many historical locations like Iwo Jima and the Sea of Tranquility, which is the spot on the moon where, in our world, US astronauts landed on the moon. There's even a mural showing a rocket, lunar lander, and an armed astronaut, but that is all we get as far as established lore and anything else that can be said is just pure conjecture. A military contractor set about constructing virtual reality simulations in order to aid military training, and we are aware of two locations that they successfully implemented their designs. In the Capital Wasteland, an armory was fitted with a simulation of the Anchorage Liberation, as well as a system in the Mount Desert Island Naval Facility in Bar Harbor, although the purpose of this latter case is not known. Rumors persisted as well that they were also responsible for creating a simulation in which all people and events were taking place, similar to the universe simulation theory that likes to get kicked around on the internet. We don't know when the true beginnings were, but by the time of the resource wars that began raging in 2052, many influential men across the United States government and military began to form a group that would come to define the post-war United States, the Enclave. Lore confirms that some of these early members were joint chiefs of staff in the military. Somehow, rumors surfaced that spoke of a shadow government that pulled the strings behind the scenes, but this never led to any serious effort to find such a group. One of the main objectives of the Enclave in the years before the Great War was siphoning federal money to fund their nefarious projects. One such project was the Congressional Bunker under the White Springs Resort that was fully funded by the Department of Agriculture. Under the guise of providing government officials with a way to weather a nuclear engagement and continue leading the country, it was secretly constructed to allow the Enclave to communicate with other planned bases in the US. There was even a satellite named the Kovac Muldoon that was meant to provide the Enclave in Appalachia surveillance across the region. A 29-minute early warning was given through government channels that allowed many members of the Enclave and several government officials to safely lock themselves behind the heavy blast doors at White Springs. Raven Rock was also constructed to house government officials and even had an industrial capacity with the ability to communicate with the White Springs bunker, where the Zax supercomputer at Raven Rock would communicate with the Modus AI in White Springs, simulating various scenarios up until a few months before the Great War. Raven Rock was not designed explicitly to be an Enclave base. However, the Zax supercomputer established contact with the Enclave. Control Station Enclave was an old offshore oil drilling platform run and operated by the Poseidon Energy Company, which was repurposed to be the primary Enclave base of operations. They received schematics for the X-01 Power Armor and Vertibirds in late 2077, where they would continue research and development. Located almost 200 miles off the coast of California, the location was meant to ensure safety from the nuclear warheads they were convinced would fall quite soon. So, this is the state of the entire military as Doomsday engulfed the world in flames. Defense, rebuilding, and perhaps some mop-up fighting in and around Alaska, fighting in Shanghai, Nanjing, and close-by areas of mainly Marines, fighting in Shantou, in the Gobi Desert region, and lastly, on a small island in the middle of the Philippines. In the Americas, we have occupational forces in Canada and Mexico, along with units guarding military installations and working to quell civil unrest break up unions, and beat strikers in the US. Many installations were furiously engaged in research in an attempt to give the United States an edge in the war, as well as exercising even more control and surveillance against the American population. The shadow group that would become known as the Enclave were putting plans into motion to take refuge and have the ability to come out of the radioactive ashes and take control of what was left. A small group of army personnel were also grappling with the moral implications of FEV research at the Mariposa military base and poised to build one of the most powerful factions of the post-war era. The Great War changed everything, turning former superpowers into smoldering ruins. But what of the militaries that helped propel them to their world-leading status and their eventual nuclear destruction? Unfortunately, Outside of the continental United States, we really do not know what happened, but we can make some inferences. 
With forces fighting in China, they would have undoubtedly suffered massive casualties directly from the nuclear warheads and subsequent collapse of supplies, support, and society itself. Being in the midst of the enemy would not bode well. However, there is a good chance that at least an element of American servicemen survived and integrated with the surviving societies. This is based on an example of Chinese sailors doing that exact thing on the American mainland, establishing a very influential faction called the Xi. I think it is very probable that groups of American servicemen in China and perhaps in the Philippines have their own societies or have integrated with local populations with some of their traditions and influence preserved. Likewise, forces in Canada and Mexico would be in a similar situation. Although it is also likely that survivors would have been able to make a successful journey back to the United States in order to find family and loved ones, or out of a sense of duty to the country as the military command structure was completely cut off. Shifting gears from the plausible scenarios to established lore, we look at the events that unfolded after October 23rd. The military units that were stationed stateside to enforce martial law and crush dissent found themselves oftentimes dead, but in the case that they were alive, military checkpoints were established in order to facilitate evacuations, cleanup operations, and to cordon off areas with high contamination. Locations that were not destroyed and were deemed essential also had some sort of military presence, although these attempts were disorganized and half-hearted, with desertions highly prevalent. The remnants of these military checkpoints are found throughout the capital wasteland and commonwealth. The National Catastrophe Relief Auxiliary that was deployed the day before the bombs had most of their numbers wiped out since they were stationed in Washington, D.C. Those that survived on the outskirts tried to carry out their duties of seeing to those injured and in need but found themselves overwhelmed and demoralized. The branch of the Relief Auxiliary in Appalachia suffered a similar fate. However, the automated airdrop system that was successfully implemented before the Great War was still operational and used by the residents of Vault 76. Not much is known about the detention facilities staffed by military personnel, however, things likely did not end well for those in the centers. Turtle Dove is still patrolled by security robots hundreds of years later, likely meaning that escape was impossible even if abandoned by the staff that worked there. This would mean risking escape or dying slowly in the camp since there were no more incoming supplies. Back at the Mariposa military base in what was California, Captain Roger Maxson was in the middle of interrogating scientists after his team found out and were angered by the work being done there, experimenting with FEV on military prisoners with horrific results. In the middle of an interrogation with the head researcher, Leon von Felden, the facility abruptly lost contact with everyone else as communication systems were disrupted and destroyed by the bombs. Being spared on nuclear death themselves, Maxson declared themselves independent from the United States Army and government and ordered everyone to prepare to leave the base. After finding minimal atmospheric radiation, they left on October 27th after burying the bodies of the scientists they had executed. They made their way to the Lost Hills government bunker, where they intended to take shelter and regroup. Suffering casualties along the way, a few individuals wished to go to the West Tech facility to attempt to do what would come to define this group for decades to come, recover advanced technologies. This group would die in this endeavor, but the main group would expand and form the Brotherhood of Steel that took on a militaristic command structure and placing their main focus on combat and recovering pre-war advanced technology. Across the continent, all the way in West Virginia, a group of army rangers had been engaged in war games with a large group of marines when the old world met its end. The group led by Elizabeth Taggarty was left in darkness as there was no command structure left to speak of and in the midst of deciding what they should do was contacted by Roger Maxson over the radio. Although it took some convincing due to the group's loyalty to the United States, he eventually convinced them to join the Brotherhood and create the Appalachian branch. Their skills and training served them well and their influence grew, as did their organization as people flocked to their strength. The threat of the Scorched and the Scorched Beasts were challenges that they found themselves slowly losing to on the battlefield and wished to use nuclear weapons to neutralize the Scorched threat. Maxson refused, which is something understandable given the recent events, but the Scorched Beasts proved too powerful, destroying the Appalachian Brotherhood with Taggarty dying in 2095. When communication ceased, Maxson sent the First Brotherhood Expeditionary Force to find what happened to the Appalachian Brotherhood and re-establish contact. Upon finding no Brotherhood members remaining, the First Expeditionary Force set about rebuilding the Appalachian Brotherhood. 
The Enclave had two known bases of operation in the pre-war United States, Control Station Enclave and the White Springs Bunker. Enclave members are confirmed to have retreated to many different locations, however, we do not know any information on where these sites might be. The control station, often called the Oil Rig, survived the Great War and was a place of a lot of research and development, where pre-war designs of power armor, vehicles, and FEV were improved upon, indicating a good deal of industrial and scientific capacity. These resulted in the improvement of the X-01 power armor into the Advanced Power Armor and Advanced Power Armor Mark II variants, as well as operational and effective vertebrates and FEV research that culminated in the creation of the mutated cyborg monstrosity that was my ex-girlfriend, just kidding, Frank Horrigan. Enclave forces on the oil rig were incredibly regimented and insular, not interacting with the rest of the US mainland to a high degree until many, many years after the Great War. Raven Rock, while not initially an Enclave base, would become a base after the destruction of the oil rig and the Zax supercomputer now known as John Henry Eden commanded Enclave forces to relocate there. Things would not end well once again for the Enclave as Raven Rock itself was destroyed during the course of Fallout 3's events. The White Springs Bunker, while also doomed to a similar fate as the other bases, had a slightly different history. Although many people took refuge at the bunker since it was built under the guise of protecting members of the government, all those that were not members of the Enclave were summarily executed. A huge setback, however, was that the military had cut communication lines between White Springs, Raven Rock, and the Oil Rig after finding these communication routes suspicious. This secluded branch of the Enclave set about trying to launch what nuclear missiles remained in the Appalachian region at China. However, this was fraught with complications. In order to launch the missiles, the automated systems outside the silos had to detect threats and after trying many different tactics, they eventually created Scorch Beasts by exposing irradiated bats to some of their biochemical agents. This new menace, along with the accompanying plague, went on to eradicate all human life in Appalachia for some time, even going on to destroy the Appalachian Enclave itself. Many military servicemen found themselves attracted to the Brotherhood of Steel and Enclave after their command structures were completely destroyed by the war. Many saw these groups as a legitimate successor to the now defunct military, or joined because it was the closest thing to the military they were once a part of. Still others were convinced by the ideology of some of these groups and joined on that basis, while some joined out of pure desperation. One such example in Appalachia is that of Ellen Santiago, who was the leader of a large unit of soldiers stationed in Washington DC before the Great War. She ordered her surviving soldiers toward Appalachia on rumors of the congressional bunker and actually made contact with the Enclave there. Although unsure at first, she was eventually convinced to join the Enclave in order to exact revenge against the communists that she thought had initiated the destruction. The Enclave group happily accepted active military members into their ranks to bolster their positions and push towards their stated goals. Military bases and locations were highly sought after by survivors of the Great War due to the large amount of supplies, weapons, and sometimes defensive structures. Nellis Air Force Base, despite taking damage from nuclear detonations, still had enough usable supplies that members of Vault 34 made it their new community and used the artillery found there to defend themselves. The Desert Mountain Naval Base was found by Dima in Far Harbor, where he used it for some time before gifting it to the Children of Adam, where it became their settlement. The Enclave took control of Adam's Air Force Base and used the large rocket platform as their own mobile base crawler after the destruction of Raven Rock. The equipment left behind by servicemen or in armories and stockpiles were highly sought after by survivors, who used it to defend themselves or to get ahead through threats and violence. Military robots still roam the wastes, often trying to accomplish the directives they were assigned before the bombs dropped or defending long abandoned facilities. It would make sense that all of the research projects conducted before the Great War were stonewalled after supplies, funding, and personnel were no longer able to continue the research, and for many projects, that is the case. One such example is Project Cobalt from Nuka World, that no doubt the Enclave or Brotherhood of Steel would jump at the chance of recovering the tech, but it was meant to lie dormant in Nuka World until being uncovered by the sole survivor. Some projects were never abandoned, like the advanced power armor projects which yielded superior protection to anything developed pre-war. 
Some projects were revitalized, like the infamous Liberty Prime project that was meant to be the Army's ace in the hole against the Chinese. Sitting unused below the Pentagon with a power supply issue that the pre-war mines could not solve, Elder Lyons, who was the leader of the Capital Brotherhood contingent, dedicated all his group's resources to the project. The previous problems were solved, and the robot was key in defeating the Enclave, who had come to stake their claim as the legitimate post-war governing body. So while the US military in name no longer exists, and many of the personnel were casualties in the Great War, or deserted in order to survive, the equipment, automated systems, artificial intelligences, and research went on to shape the post-war world as groups grapple to secure those resources or continue the research for their own benefit. Similarly, groups like the Enclave would claim to be the continuation of the government and military, and with their shows of strength and military facade, many people, particularly service members, were attracted to these groups, as they seemed to fill the void that the military's destruction left in the wake of the Great War. There is no doubt that this will be a continued trend in future games as we explore new places in future titles. After all, one of the main themes of the games are that even after humanity nearly wipes itself off the face of the planet is war, war never changes. If you made it this far, congrats. We are at the comment highlight portion of my videos where I go over some comments from my previous video and I respond directly to them. My last video was the fourth, or was it the fifth? I can't even remember now, installment of the Fallout Bible. A big addition to my last video garnered a lot of mixed reactions, and that was the inclusion of Rad Queen as part narrator in the video. Again, reactions were mixed with some people liking it quite a bit, and others, not so much. I'm gonna leave it up to her as to when and if she helps out in another video, but it probably won't be for some time. Thanks to everyone who left respectful feedback, we are all on the same team after all. Some people left comments noting that my remark about nuclear winters not being directly referenced in the game was incorrect, as Randall Clark from Honest Hearts is said to mention one. So get out your microscopes and razor blades and let's split some hairs because that is the only kind of fan that watches a 50 minute long video going over the installment of the Fallout Bible. Let's be honest. A direct reference to nuclear winters is not made. However, he references what could be aspects of a nuclear winter on three occasions. Once when he says the sky looks all wrong, which we are left to wonder exactly what that means. Another time when he says that the rain is black, meaning that it is catching ash and soot in the air as it rains. And another time to say that there was a storm that deposited snow that glowed green and that radiation levels in the air dropped enough he could risk going out. Meaning the wind blew radioactive fallout and the snow caught it as it fell, depositing it on the ground. While these things could mean there was a nuclear winter, it definitely does not mean that there definitively was a nuclear winter. I would expect observations about being unusually cold or a noticeable amount of vegetation dying to also be mentioned if it was a true nuclear winter. Another reason it doesn't necessarily refer to a nuclear winter is these events seem to happen a few months after the bombs fall and then never again, indicating that the ash and soot were low enough in the atmosphere that a few months of storms was enough to bring it down to survivable levels. It may be a reference to a small nuclear winter or it may be reference to localized fallout and ash. We would need more lore on the matter to really draw a solid conclusion. Just another account here left a good comment about the intelligent death claw genes being on the Y chromosome. If someone has background in biology or genetic inheritance, then it would be interesting to hear from you in the comments. Fallout 2 never seems to draw a distinction between males or females being intelligent more often, and it seems like it is distributed throughout the group of death claws very evenly. I could see a case where it is actually on the X chromosome which means that it expresses itself more readily in males than females, since the smaller Y chromosome may not have that information. It would be kind of similar, but not an exact comparison, of course, to why colorblindness is overwhelmingly a male issue. Perhaps this is more in line with what the developer had in mind, or perhaps just another account's assessment is correct. I want to hear your thoughts. That is it for this comment highlight. Thank you all for coming to the altar of Adam and partaking of his wisdom. Take care of yourselves and bask in the light of the undying glow.